including women in various um, kinds of relationship of yearning or um, success or failure or uh, uh, wealth or run out resources, various kinds of machines and body parts, the moving of body parts from room to room and their ontological transformation in the movement, the way the translations of parts and their reintroduction uh, transform senses of self. Uh, as an ethnographer, Karis has a wonderful ear for hearing the way people narrate their own relationship to variously distributed parts that are and are not um, uh, parts of themselves in these narrations. She then, uh, she talks about ontological choreography, the kind of dance of being as a verb, and a verb that is very, uh, that is irreducibly historically specific, irreducibly semiotically material. It is not all the time everywhere. It is about these relationalities as they constitute the actors in their very action. Right? So that the actors are the product of the relationality and don't in some kind of preset way simply enter into relationships um, with boundaries more or less intact at the end of the day. Okay? That's the, the kind of imagination Karis is trying to develop as an ethnographer of technoscience. And I'm plagiarizing from her ruthlessly in thinking about companion species that informs my way of thinking about the cross-species relationship, which is also mediated by our entire cultural apparatus, most certainly including these um, various kinds of uh, enterprised up uh, relationships to, uh, to biomedicine, in veterinary practice, to reproductive and other technologies, to pedagogical doctrines. If you're not clicker training your dog, you're an ethical reprobate. Uh, <laughs> I learned that my godson in Montessori school was being subjected to the very same pedagogical doctrines that I was learning in obedience training with our dogs. Um, and then I learned that the history of pedagogical doctrines runs parallel with animals and children for a long time, that this was not news. It's one of those discoveries, you think you've discovered something and then, then you check around a little bit because you have a few more or less retarded scholarly skills and you find out that this is very old news indeed. <laughs> and how could you have not known? Uh, that the training of dolphins for sea life and for the Navy had a whole lot to do with the way your godson was being taught to integrate his, his body um, and sensory motor systems in achieving certain kinds of self-control of his temper. Uh, how could I have not known that he was being trained up as a perfectly good dolphin for Sea World? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that my dog, too, would someday uh, be worthy of Montessori school and that she was properly enterprised up and a, a perfectly good feminist yuppie dog and an alpha bitch worthy of her species. Uh, you know, and that all of this is, of course, funny. I mean, I find research funny most of the time. Uh, it's a kind of, the, that serious joking relationship anyone with a sacramental consciousness has to reality. Uh, this can't possibly be what they mean, and yet it appears to be. Uh, <laughs> that sort of outrageous scandal of what is that's at the heart of critical theory, I think. The, the fundamental impulse of critical theory is the outrageous, but nonetheless true scandal of what is. Uh, well, that's my relationship to this stuff. <laughs> uh, but it's also a, maybe a gentler relationship with that. It's also finding uh, the creativities, the, the, the interesting crosstalk, the sorts of ontological choreographies that are making lives worth living, that are producing a going on together that is less committed to um, nuclear, uh, to the kind of death-defying heroics, more committed to mundane dailiness, more about the ordinary ethical accountabilities of life in these worlds, which aren't all the time everywhere. That out of these worlds, I th I'm finding uh, absolutely wonderful practices of, of mundane dailiness, the inquiry into the, the, the uh, kind of ethical and epistemological um, worlds which, are, which we are coming into and bringing, bringing about. So I'm not finding a scolding consciousness as a particularly useful guide uh, into these, um, in my particular case, dog cultures, which is where I've been spending all of my time the last couple of years. Um, so, I w so I use the term companion species neither to scold nor edify but as a kind of interrogative term about this sort of historical emergent with other animals who are not meat animals, are not lab animals, are not wilderness animals, are not war dogs, are not um, vermin, are not pariah dogs, but very particular historical relationships here. So this is not dog and man. Okay. So with that in mind, um, let me um, tell you something about the um, 
dog genome projects that uh, are going on, of which there are at least three large international projects. And for this, I do need the next slide. Okay. This is a late 20th century or early 21st century Gregor Mendel. You can see the monk, uh, who is not with his pea plants, but with the double helix. Another object you can't go through daily life without tripping over. Uh, I think the fetus, the fetus, and Michelangelo's t you know, creation touch are, are um, inescapable daily imagery in technoscience. Now, dog genome projects, as I said, exist uh, in three large international projects, one in France, in Rennes, the Canine Radiation Hybrid Mapping Project, which in involves a multinational collaboration to produce a, uh, a dog genetic map uh, using a certain set of technologies not being used by the other projects. A collaboration involving the Fred, uh, second project is, involves a collaboration among the um, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and the National Cancer Institutes, University of California, Berkeley, Cornell, and Ralston Purina Dog Food, uh, a very important mover and shaker. Uh, in, um, because for one thing, they want niche diets. They want to be able to market metabolically um, uh, favorable foods uh, for niche marketing for uh, dogs who can afford that kind of nutrition. Uh, uh, anyway, there's more to it than that, but Ralston Purina is one of the great modernizers of the human-dog pet relationship. Uh, Rin Tin Tin, Lassie, and Ralston Purina and Gaines um, will get you a long way in this story. That's one of the um, very interesting dog genome projects is run out of that collaboration. And still another is being run out of a multinational collaboration of over 21 countries, European, North American, and Asian. Um, not any Latin American countries that I've seen, but I may be out of date. It's the International Society of Animal Genetics uh, working on a project called DogMap. All of these are somewhat competing projects, and part of what's at stake is whether, as it is at stake in the human genome, whether the uh, genetic markers and genes mapped and identified will be in the public domain or will be, uh, uh, in the pro uh, will be owned as property, will be have proprietary rights attached to them. So that the International Society of Animal Genetics is the only one of these three projects committed to putting all of its data in the public domain um, and um, attempting to resist the rather complete market logic of, out of, of the enclosure of the commons of the genome, which is by and large the rule in um, the genome enterprised up. That's not news to anybody. There's a range of companies that I just want to name in contemporary animal, animal, uh, companion animal species culture. Uh, all of them have the spliced names that we've gotten used to in biotechnology in general. For example, there's VetGen, which is a startup company uh, bringing together uh, geneticists from the University of Michigan, Michigan State University, and some others, putting out several hundred markers, uh, all trademarked and under proprietary protection. There's PE Zogen, which is a spinoff of Perkins Elmer, a very big transnational mover and shaker the same company that spun off Acelera Genomics that has published the human genome uh, in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health but pushed the speed of the human genome project a lot. There's a dog version. Um, Imgen, uh, an, an immunological biogenetics corporation. Optigen for eye diseases. Dog, dogs turn out to be models for uh, eye diseases of interesting kinds. Also the, breed, the dog breed culture has considerable interest in these specific diseases. Uh, and then the various cryopreservation banks that I named earlier. Now, in that context, that kind of ecology of the dog genome, I want to move my talk along by referring to dog internet culture around the questions of, um, around the interactions between uh, dog breeders and scientists, between uh, different communities of expertise the languages of expertise of the breeders and the languages and practices of expertise of the geneticists as they come together in three internet-mediated social material sites these days. One of them is the Canine Diversity Project website, which is a kind of pedagogical effort put together by a geneticist at the University of Ottawa, John Armstrong, uh, that uh, sets up a whole range of linkage sites uh, for following through dog uh, genetic health issues. 